This is section 6, using PuppetDB to collect and report data. In this section, we'll look at configuring PuppetDB, we'll look at the Puppet query language, we'll look at querying with the command line with curl and in our Puppet code, we'll look at checking node status, and we'll look at collecting exported resources, which is how we can pass information from one node catalog into another. Configuring PuppetDB. In this video, we'll look at PuppetDB and its purpose, we'll look at installing and starting PuppetDB, and we'll look at configuring Puppet to report to PuppetDB. On our own, our Puppet server waits for an agent to connect. It then collects the facts from that agent, builds a node catalog, passes that down to the agent, which then applies it. But our Puppet server does not hold on to any of that fact or node catalog information in any kind of persistent store. If we want a persistent store for all of that information, we use PuppetDB. PuppetDB is a separate installable program that we can run in our Puppet environment, either on the same host as our Puppet server or on a separate host. It collects information about nodes and catalogs. The facts, the classes that were applied, the resources, all of that information goes into a relational database that is then searchable. In order to use PuppetDB, we need to install and configure it, and we also need to configure our Puppet server to talk to it. Let's look at how both of those things are done. We'll start with the installation of PuppetDB. You'll notice that because of the complexity of all these steps, I've chosen to implement this as a Puppet module, and I've separated the work into two classes. One class does the installation and setup of PuppetDB, and the other class does the configuration of the Puppet server to talk to PuppetDB. By splitting things into two classes, we make it possible to separate out PuppetDB to run it on a separate server from where our Puppet server is running. So this is a good example of the use of modules and classes. We have one module because everything we're doing is related to PuppetDB, but we have two separate classes because we might want to apply different configuration to different servers, and separating into classes allows us to do that. If we put everything in the same class, it would be much more difficult to separate things in that way. To use PuppetDB, we'll need a relational database. In this case, I'm using Postgres. We create a Postgres user database, and then we install a required extension that does some text-based processing functions that PuppetDB uses. Now that we have the relational database set up, we can install the PuppetDB package and then configure PuppetDB with the location of Postgres, host, port, database name, username, password. All that done, we can now start the PuppetDB service. So that was a relatively straightforward configuration. Our setup of the Puppet server is a little bit more complex. We'll jump over to the other class and see how that's done. So you can see here we start by installing a PuppetDB Termini package. That's a package that tells the Puppet server how to talk to PuppetDB. Now at this point, we're going to be making changes to Puppet server configuration files. And when we're done, we're going to want to restart the Puppet Server service. However, this particular class is a PuppetDB class. It's not a class related to the Puppet Server. So we want to have a notify statement like this one in our file and our other resources so that the Puppet Server is notified, which means it's restarted, if any of these files are changed. But we don't want to explicitly declare the Puppet Server service as a resource in this particular class because this class is designed for PuppetDB. There might be some other module out there somewhere that already is designed to set up our Puppet Server. If that other module, that Puppet Server module, if it declares a service resource for Puppet Server and this class also declares a service resource for Puppet Server, we're going to have a duplicate resource conflict. To work around that, we use this ensure resource function from the Puppet standard library. The Puppet standard library, you can see the module right here, 
It's a module you can install using Puppet Module Install, which we saw in a previous section. In this case, what Ensure Resource will do for us is it will make sure that in the catalog there is a service resource called Puppet Server that has this parameter Ensure running. If that resource already exists, it will leave it alone. If it doesn't yet exist, it will make sure it gets created. So that's how we can avoid having a duplicate resource conflict while at the same time guaranteeing that we will wind up with a service resource called Puppet Server so we'll be able to use it in a notify statement and not have to worry about it not being there. In addition to this file configuration, which tells the Puppet Server where to find PuppetDB, the hostname and port, we also have a couple of INI settings. These INI settings, this resource type, is declared in this INI file module, which is another module you can install yourself with Puppet Module Install. What it does is it controls INI type files with sections and individual values. So we set two different values into the master section that together tell the Puppet server to talk to PuppetDB to store its configurations. Once we have those two files that we require and we have the two INI settings in place and we restart the Puppet server service as a result of this notify, then Puppet server, every time an agent shows up with facts and it applies a catalog, all of the fact and all the catalog information will go into PuppetDB. So if we go over to our system, we can see exactly what we have running for a PuppetDB service. I'll start out with the status of that service. You can see here our service is running. It's Java-based, and then you can see it has a main process identifier. Now this particular PuppetDB service will listen on two different ports. Let's take a look at which ones those are. You can see that we're listening on port 8080, but only on the local host, only on 127001. That is a regular HTTP port that we'll look at for curl for queries in an upcoming video. The other port it's listening on, it's listening on all IP addresses, so it's listening on the external addresses as well. That's port 8081. That's HTTPS. It uses the same setup for certificates that our Puppet server is using, and so it will check the certificates of anyone who tries to use it. This port 8081, this is the one that our Puppet server talks to PuppetDB over. Of course, it has those certificates to offer so that it's authenticated and it's a secure connection. Now that our PuppetDB service is running, if we run a Puppet agent run on this particular host, what will happen is, as it uploads the facts to the server, collects the catalog, and applies it, all of the associated information will be loaded into PuppetDB, stored in the database, so that we can search it. Now, one thing that's really important to know about that is that it means that PuppetDB must be running for our Puppet server to continue to work. If we stop PuppetDB, as we've done here, and then we rerun that Puppet Agent command, what we'll see is that that agent command actually fails. It'll attempt to, it'll connect to the server, it'll send it its fax, it'll attempt to collect the catalog and apply it, but it won't be able to send that information up to PuppetDB, and so the server will actually fail. So if you're building a large-scale, highly available Puppet installation and you're using PuppetDB, it's important to know that you'll want your PuppetDB service to also be highly available. You don't want it to be a single point of failure because if it goes down then your puppet server will not be able to apply new catalogs to any of the nodes that are out there. Still with that understood there is a lot of value in what PuppetDB can do for us 